Hey Mets fans, it's Emily Reppert here. Was well, the New York Mets celebrate 60 years of baseball, we are catching up with alumni to talk about the team's history and their personal experiences. And today we are with 1969 World Series champion Art Shamsky. Art, thank you so much for joining us it's today. It's great to be here talking about uh, 1969 and other great years with the Mets. Yeah, absolutely. So let's start. Let's start off with your career with the Mets, getting acquired by the Mets. What was that like? Well, when I first heard about it, I came up with the Cincinnati Reds, uh, spent eight years with them, uh, minors and big leagues. And uh, when I first heard about the trade to the Mets, I was a little uh, disappointed at first because the Mets were not a good team. Mm -hmm. I wasn't crazy about New York. Um, it, it, was, uh, it was just a little bit of a shock. And, um, you know, who, who knew a couple years later we'd win the World Series and my life would change and I'd be in New York ever since. But, but uh, the first hearing about the trade, I think when I heard it was New York, I thought it was the Yankees. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the Yankees had been, you know, a team that everybody knew about when I, when I was a kid growing up for me in St. Louis. But, um, you know, it, it turned out to be the best thing that ever happened to me in my career. But uh, it, in the initial shock, we had, had to take a couple of days of, to, to get through. What was the perception at that time of Queens and the New York Mets? Well, you'd, if you played the Mets uh, three games, if you didn't win two out of the three, you would be it would be a bad series. Right. Uh, the Mets were losing 100 games every year. Um, they came into existence in 1962 and, and almost finished everything, I think, every year last place. To, uh, and so when you didn't win consistently against them, it was a disappointing series. Um, and, and so I think, you know, my initial reaction to joining them was, uh, well, maybe it would be a great opportunity, but at the same time, it's a, a team that's known as the lovable losers, mm -hmm. losing organization in terms of, of wins and losses. And so uh, my, my, my initial shock was, was, was there, but, but you know, I, I got to meet guys. I knew a couple of the guys who were on the team, so that made it a little bit easier for me. And again, the other thing was, like I said, I didn't really, wasn't crazy about New York. I would come in as a visiting team and you didn't really spend much time going out too much. It was, it was, even though I grew up in a pretty good sized city in St. Louis, uh, New York was this big, huge city that, uh, that was a little uh, uh, overwhelming at times. Right. But, uh, but I fell in love with the city when I got here, moved into it, and I've been in the city, what, 50-something years wow. now. So, so uh, I guess I got used to it. Yeah. So when you got there, you know, what was that experience like, and when did things kind of start to change? Well, when I first came, I got traded, I came up in the wintertime, and I, I knew I had played the minor league baseball against Eddie Cranepool, even though he wasn't there very long. I spent uh, a little time playing against him, and a couple of the guys I knew having played against him in the minor leagues, in the big leagues. Um, but uh, just getting into New York and, and, and meeting people. What's interesting about myself being traded to the Mets is when I got the call from the general manager at Cincinnati, a gentleman by the name of Bob Hausam, I had just had the first of a number of surgeries on my back, and I thought he was calling to see how I was feeling. And before he could say anything, I said, Mr. Hausam, uh, I really appreciate you calling. I just want to let you know I feel great. And I felt terrible because it was about a week after I got <laughs> surgery in St. Louis. And he said, well, that's great that you feel good because we just traded you this morning to oh, New wow. York. And I said, really? And, I, and that was my first reaction was to the Yankees. And I said, oh, oh great. Uh, uh, what team? And he said, the Mets. And I, I just right Heart off the bat. I, yeah. <laughs> but what's interesting about that is that I knew the general manager of the Mets at the time, uh, Bing Devine who I knew as a kid growing up in St. Louis. He had been the general manager of the Cardinals for many years. Um, he had scouted me, and, and I, I just knew him. And, and he then called me and talked to me about uh, the Met organization and said, uh, you know, we're looking for some left-handed power. We've been trying to make this trade for a while. And he merely made me feel a lot better. And, and I, I said, well, thank you so much for this call. And about two days later, I picked up a paper and read where he left the Mets to come back to the Cardinals as general manager. I was his last trade after telling me how great it was uh -huh. in New York. So, so it took me about a week to get over all this stuff. And, uh, but again, it turned out to be the best thing that ever happened in my baseball career. Yeah, and being a part of 1969 Mets, walk me through that team that season and the, the magic that happened. Well, when I got over in 1968, my first year, it was also the first year of Gil Hodges. Uh, a lot of other really great players, Tommy Agee, um, Al Weiss, J.C. Martin, we all came at the same time. And, and I remember spring trading my first year in 1968 when Gil was the manager. And I had heard about him. I had watched him as a player growing up as a kid in St. Louis. I, he was part of those great Dodger teams in the 50s. And 
I knew what a great ball player was, and I had, I had, I had heard that he's this really stern, tough manager. And the very first day in spring training, he had this meeting, and he said, uh, I want all of you to know that you're not going to be the same old Mets that you were before. Well, here, I was never with the Mets mm -hmm. before, but I, he just got through saying that uh, you're not going to be the same team. And, and we knew right away that he was going to be a tough disciplinarian, uh, but it turned out uh, he was the, the catalyst on that 69 team. And even though 68, we, we finished ninth a half game out of last place, that was still only one division back then. It was the American League and the National League. They didn't split till 1969. We finished ninth. I believe Houston finished worse than us, a half game worse than us. But we could see signs that we were- Something uh, was uh, changing. Something was changing. Whether it was attitude uh, or, or, or well, we had a lot of good young pitchers. Um, but here's, what, here's the thing that I, I look back on that team. I said, we knew how to lose, we didn't know how to win. And that was the brilliance of Gil Hodges. He, teaches, uh, teach, he taught us that, that uh, uh, you know, how to prepare for games, how to um, act on the field and off the field. And uh, you could see the beginning of things changing. And then in 1969, um, he had another meeting right up, I've already been there a year now, and it's one of the first days in spring training, he said, you know, you guys, you lost a lot of one-run games. I don't know how many it was. It was 35 to 40 one-run games. He said, if you could just find ways to win those games. And he was right. He said, we knew how to lose. I knew that. I, we knew how to lose. We just had to find ways to win games, whether it's 2-1, to 3-2, 5-4, to 8-7, to seven, whatever the score was, mm -hmm. we had to find ways to win games. And Gil was, uh, was brilliant at that. He was able to get everybody involved, part of the team, and that was... That was the brilliance of Gil Hodges. But I, I think in 1969, as we started the season, we knew that we had a good young team. Did we know we were gonna win a World Series? Absolutely not. Yeah. But, but as things kind of fell into place as we got into the summer and then got into August when we were still nine games behind the Chicago Cubs, uh, all of a sudden something happened. And, and, and I think uh, it was a matter of, of just all of us just started to believe that that any one of us could could help win a ball game, and I think that was again one of the things that Gil Hodges was able to do. He got everybody involved mm -hmm. in that team. He he didn't need a printout from from stats or anything like that. He had a feel for the game, um, and so I think his his brilliance as a manager was just being able to get everybody involved, and and uh, you knew when you were going to play, and 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 he he just got that feeling about everybody being part of the team. And it led to everybody contributed to the success of that team. And so when you talk about 1969, it's just not about Tom Seaver, Jerry Kuzman, and Cleon Jones, and Tommy Age. It's about um, Bud Harrelson. It's about Kenny Boswell. It's about Don Clendenin. And it's about Jerry Grody, uh, Wayne Garrett, uh, Ed Charles. I'm going to go down the list the whole way, but it's just about everybody who was part of that team because at some point, somebody on that team contributed to the success of that team. And I think when people talk about it, even 53 years later now, it's about guys that they remember, those yeah. names who helped us win a championship. Well, I feel like even at the anniversary a couple of years ago, all these years later, you still kind of see that camaraderie. It was still very clear of you guys all being a team and working together. Well, I wrote a book called After the Miracle, which was, uh, uh, you know, one that I wanted to do. I had written, that was my second book, and I wanted to write about how close we were as a team and, and how what happened, it wasn't so much the day-to-day -day things that happened in the game, but how we were known as the lovable losers years before and how we finished ninth a year before and, and how we came together as a team and how that those relationships maintained over the years. And, and now, 50-something years later, 53 years later, we're still talking about, yeah. about the team. And I, I've always said this, and I, and I know it's pretty subjective for me, but I think there's a couple teams in the history of the game that people, when you say a year, people know who win. I think 1927, the Yankees, way before you were born, but <laughs> and way before 1969, when you, before you were born. Uh, they talk about that year because it had Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig and these great players. And you still talk about the 27 Yankees because they were such a uh, fabulous team. And I think you talk about 1969 the same way. That Met team in 1969 will be talked about forever because of where we came from, what was going on in the city and the country at the time with the war in Vietnam and all the problems New York City was having. And, coming from being the lovable losers to being world championship, I think people have passed that legacy on from generation to generation. And I have people come up to me today who weren't even born who know about that team from their parents or their grandparents. And that's the beauty of this whole thing about being part of that team because that 
legacy lives on forever. Mm -hmm. Still talking about it. All these years later and everything that you guys experienced that season and during the playoffs, World Series, is there one particular moment that stands out to you? It's the best? Well, being part of that team is the best, but I made the last out of the first game of the only game we lost. And I think about that at bat every single mm -hmm. day of my really? life. Really? Oh, I do. I, I'll never forget it. I was uh, sent up uh, to, in the ninth inning with this, uh, uh, runners in scoring position. I think I was a tying runner, uh, a tying run, and uh, ended up grounding out to second base. I could have been a hero. So it turned out we lost that first game and then and won the next four in a row. So mm -hmm. it, it, uh, in that case, it doesn't really make that much difference. Right. But in my case, I think Still about that at there. bat every single day. Wow. But, but being part of that team, no matter what you did the rest of your life, no matter what you did your whole career, being part of that team sets you aside from everything, everybody else. You'll it just, always have that. You'll always have that. Um, I always get questions about, don't you wish you were playing now, making all the money that guys are making? My first reaction is, of course I wish I was playing now. But really, I think about it. Would I trade it for this World Series ring? No. Uh, what I traded for having played against and with some of the greatest players in the history of the game in the 60s and 70s and being part of that championship team that we still talk about. You know, uh, the, the Mets have had two champions in their history, two significant teams. 86 in its own right was very significant, uh, a team that came from behind with the great players. But 1969 will always be special. Uh, when, when you talk about that, people will always remember certain things that happened. And I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. I've, over the years, I've had 100,000 people tell me they were at the last game with, at, uh, at the Shea Stadium mm -hmm. in uh, October 16, 1969. And I say to myself, great. Then I remember that the ballpark only held 52,000, 53,000 people. <laughs> and I'm saying now, <laughs> either, everyone there? Either, either they were there in person or they're there in spirit. Right. But to me, it doesn't make any difference because if they think they were there, that's all that's important. I've had people tell me they ran on the field and they grabbed dirt and they, they, they kept it and uh -huh. they did this and they did that and all these stories. They were there for the Black Cat game. They were there for the receivers almost perfect game. And I don't know if they were there or not, but if they think they were there, right. that's they fine with me. Memories. I just go along with it and say, yeah, I, well, I was there too, but what do you remember about it? And they tell me stuff and, you know, and, and I love talking about it because it's such a happy time of my life mm -hmm. and, and, and such an important year in my life. And again, my life changed October 16, 1969. I, I mean, I've got no regrets. It was just being part of the team was so special. Being part of that team and just the Mets in general and playing in New York, like you said, you know, when you first uh, got traded to the Mets, you weren't sure, and then falling in love with the city and the team and the fans, you just talked about, you know, how unique our fans are. Um, what is it, what did that mean to you to get to play? Well, it makes everything I've done worthwhile. I mean, just to be part of that team. Like I said, you could play, uh, I played 13 years and nobody talks about the other 12, which I understand. And I came up with the Cincinnati Reds with great players, uh, Tony Perez, Pete Rose, Johnny Bench. We were all teammates, and they went on to have those great years in the mid-'70s with the big red machine. But it doesn't make any difference. We, 1969, for me, it just stands out. And, and I have people today, and as we've gotten older, we've lost a lot of people who maybe have been around at the time. But again, that legacy has been passed on. And, and I used to get people honking their horns, cab drivers, bus drivers. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, a, it was great. And, so many things happen to me on a personal level after we won, whether it's, you know, doing the Ed Sullivan show, the, the Dick Cavett show. They took seven of us to Vegas to be on a stage in Vegas. We made fools of ourselves for two weeks singing um, on, on stage at Caesars Palace. I mean, they named a dog after me on Everybody Loves <laughs> Raymond. I mean, uh, wh where else would that have happened if, right. not, if, if not been part of that team? And so um, for me, just uh, having shared those moments with my friends and teammates and still talking about that team all these years later is very, very special. What, were, what would you say stands out the most of one of those moments that you had? You well, know? we made fools of ourselves <laughs> all the time. So but I think everybody loves Raymond because I, when I go out and speak now and I do these personal appearances, I always get the standard questions. Uh, who was the toughest pitcher? Um, should Pete Rose be in the Hall of Fame? And usually the third or fourth question is, how does it feel to have a dog named after you? <laughs> and everybody loves Raymond. And, and by the way, they said, do you know they named a dog after you? And I said, well, I was on the show in 1999, so it's 20-something years. So, yeah, I do know that they right. named a dog after me. But, but things like that, just, it's, it's, they're funny. They're just, it's just things that, that because of being in the right place at the right time for me was very special. And you've written now two books since. 
Tell me a little bit about those books and why you wanted to do that. Well, the first book was uh, The Magnificent Seasons. It was about 1969, 70. Um, as you probably know, um, the Jets won the Super Bowl, we won the World Series, and the New York Knicks won the NBA championship in May of 70. So you had three teams winning championships in New York at a really crazy time. Uh, the world is upside down now, right. but it was upside down back then. The war in Vietnam was tearing the country apart. The city of New York was going under. But what's interesting about those three teams is that all of us won for the first time. Nobody ever won before that. And, and I, people don't, don't remember that. And, and of course, you had these cast of characters on those teams, starting with the Jets with Joe Namath and what he meant for the NFL and the AFL at the time. And, and we had the cast of characters, and the Knicks had this great group of players uh, that playing. And so for me, that book was really about how it all came together with those three teams and what it meant for the city in New York. The second book, After the Miracle, was really about, about the camaraderie and the friendships that developed on that team and that have lasted all these years. I, I really believe that more books have been written about the 69 Mets than any sports team in the history of sports. I'm not, I'm not kidding. There's probably 50 books been written about the New York, uh, 1960 New York Mets. So I didn't want to write uh, about the day-to-day -day things that have been written about over the years. And, and the co-writer with me, Eric Sherman, and I sat down and we talked about how important this team was in the city of New York and over the years how it's maintained this legacy and it's got bigger and bigger every year. And so we talked about uh, what, what we could write about that really people might want to hear as opposed to what's been written before. And we thought about it and came up with this idea that let's talk about how this team came from nowhere and how these guys like Eddie Crane Poole and Tug McGraw and Ron Sabota were on these lovable losers teams and we all felt for them being on these bad teams and all of a sudden they turn it around and we turn it around and win and then how we became friends and stayed friends over the years and yeah. how that winning that team made us closer and closer and unfortunately we've lost 10 or 11 guys from that team but the nucleus is still there and we still uh, get together on, on occasions and, and talk about how important that was to all of our lives and for me the second book was really a a tribute to the 69 team and, and all the players I played with and the relationships I developed with those guys. Okay, let's dig in a little deeper. 1969, the NLCS, six or seven hits during that series. Yeah. Tell me about that series. Well, it was a great series for me. Um, at that point, Gil Hodges was platooning in about four or five positions at right field, first base, second base, third base, and sometimes behind the plate. And so uh, we knew that we were going to be playing the left-hand batters. And, uh, and you know, I look back on the, that, that series, and, and, and for me it was just, uh, I had three hits the first game, three hits the second game, and one hit the third game. We swept a terrific Atlanta Braves team that had Henry Aaron, Rico Cardi, Orlando Cepeda, Felipe Lou. They had some great players, and they didn't have the pitching that we had, but we swept them in three games. And as it turned out, our pitchers, the Seaver, uh, Jerry Kuzman and Gary Gentry did not pitch well in that series, gave up a lot of runs, and we ended up scoring a lot of runs. But for me, on a personal level, it was a great series. And, and, and what's interesting about it, I come off a series with seven hits in three games, and I don't start the first game of the World Series where it ended up pinch hitting right. in the ninth inning, and that's that bad I think about every day of, of my life. <laughs> but but um, it was a great series for me, and at that time, they weren't doing um, you know MVPs of series it was the first year of the playoffs and they mm -hmm. were just kind of feeling their way through maybe I would have won it who probably knows? would have been who knows? MVP. But, but it was a great series for me and uh, and that was an interesting year for me just to go back a little bit because I got hurt in spring training and missed the first 21 days of the season on a disabled list I didn't I played three games of spring training and then did not play the rest of the spring and was laid up with a bad back missed the first three weeks of the season and I didn't even know, my life was upside down at the time. I didn't even know if I was going to be playing anymore that year. Who knows what? Started on a disabled list and turned out for me, end up hitting 300, having a great series against the Braves and, and, and uh, being part of the team. So it's funny how life works in yeah. certain ways because at one moment you're, you're, you don't even know what's going to happen. You, you think, who knows if you're going to even be playing anymore and you turn out to be part of this incredible team. So. So uh, I guess it's a kind of thing where you just keep hoping for the best and, and uh, things work out for the, the way you want them to. After you guys won the World Series, did you kind of reflect on the beginning of your season thinking from I, where you started to where I, you are I now? I look back on that a lot. I think I was very lucky. Uh, um, I, 
I really kind of did not know if I was going to be playing that year. You know, back then, 69 and spring of 69, you know, you got hurt. You didn't have the medicine they have now. They didn't have the real rehabilitation equipment. You know, you got laid up and you just you just don't know. And, and for me, it was a little scary. Um, I'm still relatively young. And, and, and somebody was watching over me because I came back and, and, and really did well during the season. And, and um and you know we look back on those years and and and, and I, I imagine if you talk to all the guys who were in this platoon situation uh, it was working and we're and we're happy that we won but if we look back it wasn't great for our career because right. you 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 got limited to certain things and again i had seven hits in the playoffs and don't start the first game of the world series but we were close in the team we pulled for everybody uh, on the team and i think as it turned out it happened it was for the best but mm -hmm. but um, in the long run i don't think it helped our career but uh, but in that moment, in it's that moment, what you it guys was working. needed. Yeah. yeah. You talked about you know all the players and everyone contributed, and um, but tell me what it was like you know playing with Tom Seaver, having that experience. Well, interesting enough, I played against him in the um, in the um, in the in 19 his first year was 1967. I remember I was with the Reds, and I remember one game I hit a three run home run off him in the ninth inning. I think he was winning seven to nothing. And and I, I hit a three-run meaningless home run in the ninth inning, made it seven to three, wins the ball game. I get traded over to the Mets that winter, and we're in spring training, and you know I'm going around saying hello to some of the guys that I basically knew and some of the guys I don't know. Mm -hmm. So we kind of came together for a moment, and he says, you know, I remember that date, and he gave me the date of the home run, and he says, wow. but this is the last time we'll talk about it. And we never spoke about it again. Uh -huh. But but he was a terrific pitcher. I mean, playing against him, you could see that he had the great arm. Did you know that he was going to be a Hall of Fame pitcher and go on to have the career? There's a, a lot of guys have good arms, you just don't know. But watching him, playing with him on the same team and watching him pitch, you realize what an artist he was, what a brilliant pitcher he was. And I played mostly the outfield, so um, I didn't get the chance to, you know, back then I had great eyes. I could watch balls come out of the pitcher's hand. But when I got a chance to play first base a little bit, I really saw his brilliance on the mound because you're right close, watching him work hitters. And he was an artist. I mean, he really was an artist in an era that had great pitchers. It was Sandy Koufax, Don Drysdale, Juan Marichal, Gaylord Perry, uh, Steve Carlton, um, Bob Gibson, uh, Fergie Jenkins. I mean, and the list goes on and on in the National League, and Tom was right there amongst the best of them. I, I watched... I saw his brilliance over the years, and he was just—he was just a incredible pitcher and uh, and um, and a great teammate, you know. And, and part of the book that I wrote after Miracle was about the trip we took out to see Tom, because he wasn't traveling, and that's the closest we wanted to get in terms of, mm -hmm. of, of of the relationship that we did. I just didn't want to do an interview with him over the phone. I wanted to be with him and get out there and see him, and that really was the the catalyst of how the book starts out and the trip we took out there. But uh, just to get back to what you asked me is that he was just a brilliant pitcher in an era that had brilliant pitchers and, uh, and no doubt that uh, though I think history will show that he's one of the best pitchers of all time it's easy to say that about a lot of guys but watching him against him and watching him close up on his team as a teammate I really believe he'll he'll be remembered as one of the best pitchers of all time so you mentioned Bob Gibson you actually had your first career plate appearance against Bob Gibson. What was that like? Not only that, in St. Louis in front of my parents and my friends. Right. <laughs> yeah, well, he at that time was, you know, as good a pitcher as anybody in baseball. And um, I took a strike, a called third strike, struck out. And it was a, it was a, a, a remembrance, remembrance day for me because I'll never forget it. Next time I faced him, though, I hit a pinch hit home run off yep. of him. So, so, <laughs> so uh, it balanced out. Yeah, well, <laughs> he was a tough pitcher, but you know, you remember those certain things in your, your career, like the first at bat, first time you walk on a major league field, the, uh, all these firsts for me, but that was a that was the first that pitcher that uh, I faced in the big league. Would you say that's one of those first experiences that stands out the most? Uh, you never forget it. You just, yeah. you just, but again, it was in St. Louis in front of friends and family, and uh, and if I had my druthers, I would have rather been in, 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 uh, in Cincinnati or someplace else, but it's funny how things work out, you know. It, uh, you, you, you know, baseball, that's the greatness of the sport. It's, it's, you're going to fail more than you succeed. It's how you deal with those failures. It really is. Uh, I tell kids when I work through clinics and work, you know, it's not so you're going to get three hits and 10 at bats. You're a terrific player. You're hitting 300. 
but you made seven outs. How do you deal with those seven outs? Do you learn from them? Do you take them? Do you take it and figure out you know how you're going to be better? And that's what I try to impress upon kids because those the, those at bats, those seven outs are very important in how you deal with with things. It's, it's a character builder, and so so. Um, but I'll never forget that at bat, like the first uh, at bat in the in, in the World Series. It's, I think about that a lot those too. Those are ones that you still yeah, keep yeah, at bat night. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so just to piggyback on that, just to make your first appearance. Um, your debut in St. Louis, your hometown. Well, this is a kid, you dream about this as a kid growing up. You know, I was a big Cardinal fan. I used to lay in bed at night with a glove and pounding it, throwing a ball up in the air and okay. catching it, listening to the St. Louis Cardinal games, Harry Carey, Joe Garagiola, you know, things, games. You dream about being uh, in the big leagues. And, and, I, and for me, I didn't necessarily think about being in the Cardinals system or being in big leagues with the Cardinals. It's about just playing in the big leagues. And then you get a chance to do it, and and uh, for me, um, you know, it's funny. I've had a career where th some strange things have happened. I had four home runs in a row one time. I had three in a game and didn't yeah. start the next day, and then I had a fourth in a row and didn't start the game after that, which is another story altogether. But 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 just things happen in your career that you look back on, and first of all, you say thank God you had a career, and then you look back on these things and how you know how how did you deal with them? How did they happen? These, these strange events that happened to you and 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 so you know it, you just look at it and say hey I, I feel like I was lucky to be there lucky to be part of that and and so that's how I deal with it I just try to rationalize it some yeah, I get frustrated at times you know I just yeah. like I said I think about that at bat in the in <laughs> that first game of the World Series every single day oh, yeah you know. wow. well, let's just circle back to the Mets 60 years this year they're celebrating a baseball um, have to say about the Mets franchise? Well, all I can say it was the best thing to happen to me getting traded over to them and being part of that incredible team in 1969. Um, I, I, I wish them all the best this year. I think they'll have a, a pretty good team and hopefully they'll, and I hope the, the fans deserve another world championship. But I, I think it's, it's a tribute to everybody that uh, they've gone through some good years and bad years and able to withstand certain things. And, and uh, I think that with new ownership this year, they're going to be fine. I, th I know Steve Cohn personally. I think he wants to win. I think he's going to look back and try to do things uh, nostalgic-wise with the team. They're going to have an old-timers game this year. I think that would be important. And, and uh, I, I wish them well. At the, uh, I, you know, again, when people talk to me about my baseball career, the other 12 years uh, it doesn't mean anything. It's being part of the Mets organization and being part of that world championship team. So for me, uh, hopefully you have a great year, and, and uh, I'm just thankful I was part of that wonderful team in 1969. And thank you so much for sharing your memories with us. My today. pleasure. You, raised, you asked great questions. Great trip down memory lane. Thank you so much. My right. pleasure. Thank you.